My title of my sermon today is When I Say I Love You. When I Say I Love You. Last week we talked a little bit about trust, uh, about trust in God. And, and, you know, how do you trust somebody unless they're worthy of that trust? How are they worthy of that trust unless they're proven faithful? And how are they proven faithful unless you know what they committed to? I was thinking about today. Um, my brother and I, we, um, we, tell, we have a lot of stories, and we got more if you want to hear them. <laughs> but you probably don't. But <clears throat> I trusted him. I still trust him. He's not always walked worthy of that trust. Um, because a lot of things I trusted him were uh, pranks. I mean, when he told me to take the punk and blow on it, to light the powder that we'd stuck in a pile and the punk was only two inches long, that was not worthy of trust. Uh, but, but, you know, and I got the negative ones, but I thought, man, I rode behind that guy for hundreds of thousands of miles on motorcycles and absolutely trusted him. I didn't ride back behind him in fear. Now, the opposite never happened. <clears throat> he never rode behind me. Dad never rode behind me. I always, had to, I always had to be the rider. But I learned to ride, and I learned to live in joy back there in riding. And, and it, it wasn't like we didn't crash. We actually practiced crashing. Yeah. <clears throat> he just said, we're going to lay this thing over a few times in the old fields here, John, so we kind of get good, good at it. So all of a sudden we're... <clears throat> but trust... It's such a phenomenal thing when you really do trust because, you know, in life there's a lot of mistrust, isn't there? How many of you don't trust a lot of people, a lot of things, a lot of media, a lot of bosses, a lot of everything? And when it comes to a relationship with God, if you don't really trust him from your heart, it's going to really be hard to have a good relationship, isn't it? Even though you acknowledge him as God, if you don't trust him, if you still think he's trying to be sneaky, if you're trying, he's trying to be, um, Rick and I are talking, if he's still trying to be mysterious, I mean... You know, so the way of the Lord, you know, uh, are mysterious. It's only to those who don't know. Once you know, that's not mysterious at all. And he wants us to know how he does things. He's not trying to hide from us how he does things. He's very open about it. All he just says is come and I'll, t- I'll teach you how to do things. When I went to Donna's house right after I found out that uh, Max had died, and I walked in, and it's kind of like what Jesus well, When you walk into a situation like that, there's a lot of grieving. There's people there, they're crying, they're weeping. And uh, you guys know what it's like, and just that emotion, and, and you're wondering what to say. In fact, I got a uh, text from a young man that's in, in our church. It's uh, off to college, but he texted me this week and just said, my, my friend, my supervisor, just had a baby girl, but the cord is wrapped around her neck, and she died. What do I tell him? Now, that's, that's a great, grand question. It's a real tough one to text. It's a tough one to talk about. So it's t- a tough one to answer. And, and part of what I found is it's it's best thing you can do is not say much at all. Just, I said, somehow convey your presence through texting. But you don't have to answer anything. In fact, I wouldn't. I, I, when I come in as a pastor, I don't, try to make, I don't try to come up with answers for people. I don't try to say a lot. But I walked into the house, and then uh, Donna came out, and just, you know, she grabbed me and hugged me and just said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And that's not a time to lay out a 10-point program. You know, that's when you just, your presence then she, she did something that, that kind of startled me. She, she stepped back, came out of that grief for a moment, grabbed my face, looked right in my eyes and said, he loved you so much. And several times through this whole thing, she would do that. She just said, kind of like, and even say, John, you just don't understand how much he loved you. And she knowing that Max wouldn't be the type of guy that would, you know, talk a lot about it and do a lot about it. But that, that sparked a lot of things inside of me. And then, of course, I, you know, when I say I love you,
What do I mean? I, I've told a lot of people, I love you. I go all over, all over the world telling people, I love you. Publicly, privately, in their ear, in the microphone, I love you. I love you. One of the things when I get introduced overseas is it's, uh, a lot of times they'll say, you know, uh, or, or when somebody interviews, like some of the people I'm working with over there, they say, one thing about John is you, you feel loved when you're around him. But when I say to you, I love you, what does that mean? First of all, let's ask this question. What do I mean? If I'm going to say I love you, I've got something in mind about what that looks like. I, you know, I should anyway, shouldn't I? I, I? What does that really look like? What does that mean? What, where's the boundaries to that? Where's, you know... Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to pay all your bills? Does that mean I'm going to take care of you? What does that mean? But I've got, I've got to have something inside me of what I think that is to bring it out and say it to you. But then on the other side, what do you think that means? You know, I watch... Uh, um, Married couples, you know, and man, this word, this, these, these three little words, I love you. There's some powerful words. They're, they're words that people have totally uh, made major decisions of their life based on that, you know. Uh, just heard about a young man that I know, and he said, I love you to this girl. And, and uh, the mother said, he's never said that to anybody. He's had a lot of girlfriends, never said that to anybody. So what does that mean? And if I was a young girl, and you know, if I could slip alongside of her, I'd, I'd whisper in her ear, ask him what that means. <laughs> Describe it in detail, if possible. Because I'm telling you, uh, of all the words in the, in the world and in life, uh, how do you describe, how do you picture the word love? Jesus came to exactly represent the creator of the universe to man. That's what he came for. He came to represent him to, so that people could understand and get a grasp of who God was. And he's still doing that today. And God is the source of all things and of all life and of all power. He, God, he is God. He is the source. He is the, the word God, the word Father means originator. He's the source. So let me put it to you this way. Whether you're saved, unsaved, whether you believe in God or not believe in God, your breath, your power, your mind, your abilities, your, your strength, your everything comes from one source, comes from God. There's nobody breathing without God. There's nobody, nobody living without God. There's nobody thinking without God. God is the source of all life. He is life. He is the only source. And so he's trying to represent himself through Jesus so that we get an idea who he's like. Is how do we know what he's like? You know, and, and then everybody has an opinion, don't they? Of what he's like, they describe him, and a lot of times uh, other people's definitions of him doesn't even come close to mine. Mine doesn't come close to theirs. Jesus said this, he says, in Luke 6, 45, he says, he talks about how a good man out of his good treasure brings forth good things, and an evil man out of an e uh, uh, brings forth evil things out of his heart. But he's saying all things come out of the heart. He, he said it several times, all things come out of the heart. Now, what, what's the treasure in a heart? What's it look like? If we had a treasure in a chest, we might find gold, silver, we might find uh, rubies, we might find all those kind of things. But if you've got a treasure in your heart, what is it? What is the treasure? What's it look like? Kind of fun to think about those things once in a while, isn't it? You're going to pop open a heart, what are you going to find? He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Well, the only thing that can be in a heart that I can read about and from, from the scripture is thoughts. Words. We say words, but words look like words to us, right? Dog, cat, words. So this 
let's say thoughts for now, are ideas, visions, perceptions. That's what's inside a heart. Out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, comes your life. Everything that happens to you, you have things happening to you, but your life is a result of everything that comes out of your heart. And what's the treasure that's in your heart? Whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's thoughts, images, perceptions. So how important is it that we get good treasure, good thoughts, good perceptions? It's critical. It's everything. It's the basis of all your life. Everything. My brother and I were watching uh, Nathan play soccer. Uh, Nathan pulled, they pulled their old team together from 10 years ago, and they, they played in a tournament, and they just, just lost this morning. Uh, but they, they won. Anyway, it was so fun to watch them. Even after 10 years, they're bigger, fatter, uh, more top-heavy. <clears throat> they fall over easier. <laughs> but they still got the same walk and the same footage. I mean, you, you know, sometimes I couldn't remember the kid until I saw him run on the field. I go, oh, man, that's Nathan. That's Nathan Fosh, and he runs. Oh, yeah. Still, still the same. Yeah. And my brother and I were just talking about the importance of confidence in everything that we do. You know, when you make a mistake, you kick it over the goal and how, how so off. And golf and all, all sports, how, how big is confidence? And what keeps your confidence? In a relationship, what keeps your confidence? What shuts you down? How important is it to have confidence? Confidence is the same as trust and as faith, and we live by that, confidence. What keeps your confidence when you make a mistake? What keeps your confidence when people are criticizing you? What keeps your confidence? You know, you, how, do you, how do you have confidence to just... You you know, to blow it, but then come right back. And, and listen, if you blow your shot and you lose your confidence, you're not going to make the next one, are you? Everything is going to start getting off farther and farther and farther away. And so how important is it to have confidence? Well, how do, where does that confidence come from? And he, my brother and I were just talking about how do we help our, our grandchildren and everything else to hold their confidence? we got some grandchildren already that the first time you try to correct them or teach them, they're in self-defense mode and don't want to hear anything about it. Don't teach me. Don't yell at me. There was no yelling going on. And it's, and it's almost like, what hope do you have of getting better in something if you can't be correctable? Even if, man, I've always said this to myself, even if somebody is cruel, nasty, and rude, and disrespectful to me, if, if they have something that can, will help me, why don't I take that for my benefit? Well, you talked to me wrong. Well, so what? For your benefit, why don't you listen? Doesn't that make sense? But you can't do that without confidence. How do you, and we were talking about, how do you instill confidence? And of course, I was preparing this message, so I thought, how do you prepare with confidence? Confidence has to be an image, thought, a feeling inside your heart that's good treasure that you can bring out in any situation. You can bring out when somebody just made fun of you. You can bring out when the doctor just told you you're dying. You can bring it out when, 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 uh, when your game just went to pot and, and come back. Why? Because you've got a good treasure of what? A thought, a feeling, and a perception inside. It has nothing to do with, I mean, it has something to do with the people cheering you on. They can prompt it. But listen, everybody in the crowd can say, you're the best, you're the best, go for it. But if you don't have a treasure inside your heart of seeing you good, you don't have anything to bring out. Man, I just, how important is it to fill your heart up with a treasure of the right thoughts so that you got something to bring out? And and Jesus representing God has, has told us over and over. That's how you do it. You know, Daniel in the 12th chapter said, In the last days, uh, men will go to and fro, and knowledge will increase. But it also says there in the 11th chapter, uh, you know, that those who have insight will give understanding. And those who know their God will display strength and take action. I think the King James says, do exploits. And in this world that we live in right now with all kinds of bad news in it, if you don't have a thought inside, an image, a picture of you rising up, knowing God in the situations, and knowing that, as Jody was saying, there's going to be problems, but what do you see? Do you just see problems overwhelming you and, and hope that you get through? Or do you see, I will rise up. I know God. I will rise up, and I will display strength, and I will take action. And I will see miracles every day of my life. 
out of the good treasure of my heart, I will see miracles every day. Man, it, it, you know, actually, if you wake up in the morning say, and, and somebody just whispered, an angel showed up and said, you're going to have 100 major problems today. Bam, 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 all day long. Welcome. Good morning. Now you, out of your treasure, are going to respond to that. It's either going to be, <laughs> are you kidding me? You did it yesterday. Or you're going to say, 100 major problems means 100 major victories. This is going to be an awesome day. Out of the abundance of one's heart's treasure, they will bring forth good or evil. It kind of makes you want to get some treasure, doesn't it? Some of the right thoughts, the right perceptions. Hallelujah. We can bring forth out of our heart of treasure, understanding. We can bring forth out of our heart power. We can bring forth out of our heart that which we need to overcome. I got to admit, it is pretty fun to work with people when they're in a crisis and see them go from total darkness and discouragement to smiles on their face. You know, and when we buried Max, um, I looked down at that small crowd, but there was just faces beaming that the day before were just downcast. And a lot of that came because, forgive me, but God has placed thoughts inside of me, perceptions about death and about heaven. It wasn't a true Susie at Marta's wedding, a funeral. I've called funerals weddings and weddings funerals sometimes. But, but wasn't it awesome just the, the, how that whole thing just grew until you're just excited to be there? Tim Bonington posted something on Facebook the other day about uh, Aubrey. Uh, I can't remember how he just said it, speaking to her, saying, come on, Dad, or whatever else. And I, and I posted back as I just said, man, I, too, those last few days with Aubrey after she'd seen heaven and then, you know, and she's a 14-year-old girl that died of a brain tumor, but, uh, boy, it's, it's very easy for me to see Aubrey in heaven right now come to the edge and, and say, and Lisa and I were just talking about this, it's, it's super easy for us. There's an abundance in our hearts of looking up in heaven and seeing Aubrey coming over to the edge and say, go for it, Pastor Lisa. Aubrey was one of those girls that never gave a hug. Lisa would always make her hug her, and so, you know, she'd come up and put herself next to Aubrey. Then she'd grab Aubrey's hands and put them around her and said, you know, and then that was the hug you got from Aubrey, you know, the whole time she was stiff as a board. But when she came back from Denver after she had dreams of heaven, she came out of the bedroom and grabbed a Lisa and gave her a hug and said, I love you. We never heard those words from her before like that. Same with when I was there with her. And so it's easy for me to see her in heaven. It's easy for me. It was easy for me to see Max not only greeting his son, Eric, but part of my message was Eric grabbed his dad and said, come. Come with me. Come see him for yourself. Man, I'm telling you, that pumps me for Eric who's been there to say, Dad. And here's his dad that's been missing him. Here's his dad that goes to the, Eric's gravesite. If you go to the gravesite up there in Bear Butte, where Eric's buried, there is a patch by 10 by 10 of beautiful grass, very thick, very watered, very fertilized, everything. And the rest doesn't look so good because Max went up there every morning and watered it and sowed it. And all of a sudden, now he's with his son. But what the cool thing was, his son was saying, Dad. Come, see him for yourself. And can you imagine the understanding of the love of God that Max got when he looked into Jesus' eyes? Everybody said, well, he's with Eric, and he is. But man, I'm, telling, I'm excited about being with my family, but I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus, the author, the source of all life to you and me.
When I say I love you, what is your insight on it? What is your thoughts? When somebody says to you, I love you, what do they mean? You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I just hear it, and I go, it feels good, thank you, oh man, that's great. But then I thought, you know, when, when Donna grabbed my face and said, he loved you so much, I, it got me thinking, what does that mean? Max, what does it mean to you? I mean, I'm not clear, I just want to know, what does that mean? I, I have this feeling that, that it's great and wonderful, but really, what, what was your insights? I gave this illustration at the gravesite. I said, you know, Nathan Oviatt has married Sam, which is uh, Max's daughter. I said, Nathan, they just got married, you know, just a little year ago. And I said, Nathan walks up to Sam and says, honey, I love you. Can you cook me supper tonight and bring me a cool drink? <laughs> you know, and for some reason, everybody laughed. And I go, what does it mean when you say I love you? They got movies, they got books, they got real life out there that says, I love you so much I couldn't stand you to be with somebody else, so I'm going to kill you. That's a lot of people's, I love you. That's what it means. I have to have you for myself. I don't want you to have anybody else. I'm jealous of you. you For some people, when they say, I love you, it means, I want you to be mine. For the rest of your life, I want you to serve me, cook for me, make me feel good. That's their... Now, if a guy really laid that out when he said, I love you, I want you to really treat me good. I want you to make me feel like the greatest man on the earth. I want you to make me look good when we walk down the street. I want you to look good. I want you to look sharp because I want everybody else to be jealous of me because I got you. You know, if he really laid that all out, I'm not so sure there would be so many, oh, yeah, I want to marry you answers. I think some people say, yes, I'll marry you, because when they heard the I love you, they had one thing in their heart. They didn't know what was really in the other person's heart. Could we say amen to that? It would be wise if if you're dating somebody and they say, I love you. It might be good just to time out. Explain to me in detail what you mean when you say, I love you. What's it going to look like 10 years from now? What's it going to look like, you know, uh, when I'm sick? What's it going to look like when... What do you picture? What do you feel? The more I've been thinking about this, the more startled I am. This might not be a very kind sermon to you. This may mess you up for the rest of your life. Just to tell you that it's not only wise, but you have permission to ask, what do you mean when you say, I love you? What do you really mean? And you know, I guarantee you, everybody's got a different picture. As Joey was sharing, everybody. That's one thing Aubrey, after she saw heaven, she says, one thing I dislike about religion is religion tries to make Jesus look the same to everybody, and he's not. To the cowboy, he's got boots on and riding a horse. To the hiker, he, she said, he's got hiking shorts on and, and tennis shoes. To the, to the one who's a musician, he's, he's got an instrument, and he's playing with him. He is a source of everybody's dreams and everybody's likes, and he is not the same for all of us because he's so big and so wonderful. That's kind of a cool thought in it. Not to limit him to one perception. Everybody has a viewpoint and a picture, whether they know it or not. Whether And listen, I guarantee you, if you ask most people to ex- describe in detail what they mean when they say, I love you, most of them, I don't think, would come up with a handful of words. I think they'd find it extremely difficult to start talking. Don't you? I mean, how many of you would like to be put on the spot right now, come up here and describe in t- detail what it means when you say, I love you? It's like, oh, well... <clears throat> 
And the more I thought about it, the more some of my definition in my heart, I thought, Man, that's wrong. <laughs> that's, I, that's wrong. Well, that's not very good. Here's a thought. Every, everybody's definition of love is right. What do you mean? Well, it can't be wrong. It's right. It's their definition. When somebody says, I love you, they mean it. I'm not saying they, it's like they have a viewpoint and that's what they mean. <laughs> you can't say that's wrong. That's their viewpoint. That's what they mean. When they say the word, I love you, that's, that's what they're talking about. And you can say, well, that, that's not right. No, that's right for them because that's their definition. Doesn't it make any sense? But it may be totally different than anybody else in the room thinks. An abusive parent will say, I love you to their child. And what they mean is, I'm abusing you. And to them, it seems right. It seems okay. But now here's a big question. When God says, I love you, what does he mean? What does he mean? And he gets his own opinion. He knows what he means when he says that. My question is, what if yours is different than his? And what's the likelihood that it's the same? I'd have to honestly tell you, I think, I think I perceive some things about God's love, right? But I guarantee you, if I could see God's love clearly, I, I know it would blow me away how far off I am. So he's, he's saying, I love you. How do you respond to that? Jed, if you would be so kind to show a video. As you watch this, I just want to encourage you to uh, just think about what we're talking about. Thoughts in uh, images within our heart and we're talking about heart thoughts not head thoughts I'm a forensic artist worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011 I showed up to a place I'd never been and there was a guy with a drafting board we couldn't see them they couldn't see us tell me about your hair I didn't know what he was doing but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see him. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. Hmm. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. 
it impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. don't see what God sees. And I'm just going to challenge you for a while. Just, I'm not trying to present a lot of answers here today. I'm trying to present a little challenge. Think about it. What does God mean when he says, I love you? I hope most of us are honest enough to say, I don't think I know. And I'm sure I'm off. And as Jody began by, I think, the Spirit of God, is it's, it's the first thing to do is acknowledge, God, I need to become more aware. I, I need some help. I, 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 you're singing a song over me, and I'm not hearing it. You're dancing over me, and I'm not seeing it. But why not get to where we're aware of it? Why not find out? Why not, why not st- get courageous here? Those who know God, display strength and take action. We're, let's take some action of saying, God, Open my heart up and let me receive your thoughts and images and let me discard mine and let me start seeing me the way you see me and let me see you the way you really are and let me see life the way it really is that you see it because I want to have good treasure. And out of that good treasure, I want to bring it out. I want to have it impact other people's lives, but I need that good thoughts. I need those good images. You know, I went down and watched Nathan play, and I've watched all my kids play. I absolutely love to watch my kids play. My brother came, Elisa came, even after driving, we watched. It was just fun. And in closing, I had this one thought. I thought, um, there were some takedowns. There were some, you know, a uh, guy went, got tripped from behind and rolled, and my brother said, boy, I could still feel like I could play, but I don't want that to happen anymore. <laughs> you know, and there's still a chance it could happen. But I was just thinking, what if, what if you could uh, watch the whole game, let your son and daughters play, let them, you know, uh, we, were, we were reminiscing about how a couple of his teammates got their legs broken down there. We were pay, playing men's league with it, you know, and uh, my brother and I were playing men's league, but Nathan's team was a high school team, and they, they played the men's league just to have some good, you know, to play some different competition. And some of the older men, because they were drinking and because they were thinking they got to be tough and they didn't like the, little, you know, the high school kids, they actually played dirty and broke two of his teammates' legs. And one, you could hear it snap. I mean, we'll never forget it just. It wasn't an accident. It was on purpose. And you think, have you as parents ever said, I don't want that to happen to my kid? Well, what if you could just want, just have that whole thing happen and have it all happen and the breaking of legs and the hurting of limbs and, and the brokenheartedness and also the victories and all that. But when the game was over and it goes, <laughs> and the game's over, then you walk out, grab your son just, and, and daughter, and so you touch them, bam, their whole body's just healed. Their hearts are all healed. They feel good about themselves. It's, all, it's everything that took place was just wiped off. And wouldn't that make the game, watching the game different? When I, I don't want to be kind of, ex- I mean, frankly, if, if I was watching a game like that, I, I, you know, it would be kind of more fun to get up and say, break their legs, kill them, <laughs> take them out. <laughs> Wipe them out. Have some fun, you know. I mean, because if you knew at the end it was all going to be fixed. 
the process wouldn't be so bad to watch, would it? The pain will be short. But the victories will be in. But to see somebody play, play through their pain, you know, man, what a deal when, when, they, when they're hurting, but they're playing through that pain when they're so tired they can't already move, but they press it on and they went a little farther and they take that last kick and it goes in. Yeah! I mean, man, we were still shouting out. Just like we did 10 years ago, all us parents that were there were still just like we used to be. Lousy call, ref! At the end, everything's okay. Can I just present to you, our Heavenly Father knows the end. He knows what He has for each and every one of us for all eternity. He has the power to not only heal our, our physical bodies, but He has the power to heal our brokenheartedness, to take all the pain away, take all the sorrow, take all the disappointment, take all that stuff and just... Boom, and just bring nothing but joy and peace and life. And now, think about his viewpoint now when he's watching us play down here. And we're wringing our hands and saying, God, how could you let that happen? And he's saying, you, you can't imagine what I got for you. You're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be broken heart. You're not going to come up in eternity and slap me up and say, God, you did me a poor job. When you see what he sees, you're going to say, oh, now it all makes sense. I pray that we will be gutsy to say, God, as much as I can handle, and you know, open my eyes and let me, let me have thoughts and the images in my heart that are from you that are so different than mine. So that out of that good treasure, I can bring forth those things. See, because one of the words for faith means you have to be willing to let him change him. If you're not willing to change your viewpoint, he won't touch it. He'll let you keep your definitions and your images. Would you stand with me? By the way, life is not all about suffering. There is a lot of suffering, but it's also about a lot of victories. It's also about a lot of scores to be scored. As Christians, sometimes we sometimes tend to focus a little too much, I think, on the suffering. The Bible says all that will live righteous will suffer, but it also says that the victories are overwhelming, over and over. Our future, what few days we have left here on earth. Man, I got a call that Max was gone. I couldn't, you know, who could believe it? 50 years old, gone. That means any one of us could be gone by this afternoon. With that in mind, is this such a bad thought? Let's live. Come on. Let's lift up our heads and let's live. Yeah, there's pain. Yeah, there's sorrow. Yeah, there's disappointment. But boy, there's a lot of victory to be had. Why not go for the victory? Why not go for the win? Why not let the past be the past and be what it is, whether great or small? And why not out of your treasure bring forth some good things? And why not, while you're still here on earth, have an impact on people's lives that's good? What would be so wrong about that? Or do we have to all act like we're realist people that, oh, it's, it's, life's pretty tough, it's pretty rough, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> have a nice day. <laughs> Is it so wrong to stand up on your chair and shout once in a while and say, I'm loving my life and I'm going for it. Hallelujah. What would be so wrong about Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would 
open my heart and help me open. I know it. I'm willing, Father. I just what I'm going to tell you. I'm willing. It means uh, I'm willing for a transformation. I'm willing to have some old things uh, jerked out, swallowed up, canceled out, uh, choked down, if nothing else. Because of you uh, having the right thoughts fill my heart. You said, man, out of, out of the abundance of the heart, a person's going to live. And Father, I want some abundance of good things in my heart. I want to see things right, feel things right the way you see them. I want to see the bigger picture so that I'm not so bound up with the temporal little problems that I got. I want to see a huge, big God that can do anything. Hallelujah. But he wants us to play the game. And Father, right now there's some people and fighting cancer, fighting depression, fighting diabetes. And Father, right now as a congregation out of our heart, we bring some good stuff out and we say, we're praying for you and believing for a miracle. We're believing for the power of God out of our hearts, to get the power of God to come out out of our hearts, the love of God. said, so pray one for another that you may be what? Healed. Brought out of that despair. Brought out of that darkness. Hallelujah. Father, we're not, we're not people who are not sympathetic and not aware that there are people around us hurting. But Father, help us also not to, help us to be aware of the power of God, the Christ that lives inside our hearts, that He is more than able, more than willing to take that which is going wrong and correct it and bring it and do a miracle in their life. And Father, we step up to the plate today. And see ourselves as these women have saw, saw themselves in the negative. Father, help us today to lay some of those negative feelings we got about ourselves and, our, and just pick up and hold on and put on the right things that you've given to us. The goodness you've given us. The hope you've given us. The joy you've given us. The faithfulness you've given us. All fruits of the Spirit that you have freely given to us. And Father, we acknowledge them today that we are beautiful people on the earth with the goods to help people. And we're going to bring forth out of this good treasure, good things all the days of our life. Hallelujah. And you're singing over us, you're shouting over us, saying, play the game. Play it well. I'll fix, I'll heal, I'll mend anything that gets damaged. You're going to be okay. So be it. So be it. Amen? So be it.